Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, Xeno scum, filthy heretics. Today, in episode four of the Triple Ones podcast, we're going to be talking about uh, sportsmanship in general, kind of going into take backs, playing by intent, the pregame discussion, and uh, that we basically believe Warhammer 40,000 is an open knowledge game where you shouldn't hide your rules. Yes. Um, yeah, we'll go into definitions of these and... Uh, Get crack a lacking. Yeah. Play it fast and loose. Yeah, fast and loose, boys. We don't know what's going to happen in this one. As no always, idea. I am Zach Wallace, and I'm here with... Jasper Axelson. And let's dive right in. Let's just deep dive right into this B. <laughs> so uh, I figure first we can just kind of go over what, what the pregame talk is. People talk about the pregame talk a lot with your opponent in a competitive sense. What does that mean in a tournament? So Zach, what does a pregame talk mean to you? So this is like the few minutes you spend before you actually start setting up and playing the game, going over your list, all the weird janky abilities that your army can do. Um, I personally try not to withhold anything. Uh, I give out a lot of my my big tricks, all my warlord traits and psychic powers, all that good stuff. Um, how forthcoming are you usually, Jasper? I I love the same. I. Warlord traits, relics, and any weird stratagems or abilities that are just kind of break the game, you know? Mm -hmm. So things like, oh, this unit can advance and charge. Redeploys are a big one. Can you redeploy? Yeah. That's uh, a fights one. last. Huge. Mm -hmm. Heroic interventions. Anything that just is abnormal with the game, uh, I like to disclose immediately and let my opponent know. Be super open because the last thing I want is to gotcha somebody. Yeah. And I... I, yeah, and a gotcha is just kind of where you're allowing your opponent to do just an egregious error such as let's say you don't tell your opponent that you can redeploy something and then you don't tell them and when they go to move you then redeploy something yeah. along those lines just creates feels bad moments and leaves someone feeling a bit cheated yeah for me i never want to win a game because someone felt like, ah, if I had known this rule, I wouldn't have just immediately lost. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to win because I outplayed my opponent. I was the better general in yes. this matchup. Yeah. And uh, something you ta you told me was, uh, for pregame talks, you kind of do this sneaky little trick where you get your opponent to tell you first, and then you'll kind of base how the game is going to go based on that. Yeah, I, uh, so, I like to let my opponent give me their pregame talk first. Because uh, you can kind of feel out how forthcoming and open and like what the level of sportsmanship is going to be. Some people don't like to tell you any information. Uh, you're really going to have to pry and ask them questions. And having them go first is, is kind of a good way to judge. Yeah, I'll let you know what, what the game is going to be like. Yeah, I like absolutely. That. Like, if, if they're really forthcoming, I'll go above and beyond yes. to give them every bit of information. Yes. And uh, with the pregame move, or with not pregame move, uh, pregame talk, I think it's super important to talk about what kind of game is this going to be? Meaning, is this going to be a game purely on whatever is measured, that's how we're going to play? Or is it going to be based on intent? Intent is a big word thrown around in the Warhammer competitive community. And essentially, to me... Usually, playing by intent means agreeing upon what the board state is and what it is going to be once movements take place. Mm -hmm. So this kind of means things like measuring threat distances. Distances. So, for instance, Terminators move, typically move five inches, and then they can advance or uh, charge within twelve inches. So if you stay seventeen point one inches away from that Terminator unit, you can now never be targeted or charged by that Terminator unit. Mm -hmm. Typically. So with your opponent, you go, hey, I'm going to measure out 17.1. Do you want to help me and make sure we're both on the same page? This is out of your charge range. Yep. And with this, you know, Warhammer is a game of inches, so it can be super important. And, you know, it's not a perfect game. So things might be bumped a little bit. You might move a little bit too far. So you just want to avoid those feels bad situations where you're like, I thought this was going to be out of range and now it's not. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it's... It's a game of precise and perfect measurements played by humans with physical models. Like, we are, we are terribly imprecise by nature. Yep, we bump tables. We, oh, I, my uh, measurement was 6.5 inches on accident. Mm -hmm. 
just looking at the tape measure from a slight angle instead of yes. directly above. Yep, it can be huge. And, you know, a lot of times at tournaments, you don't even have the room to make it super mm-hmm. precise. So agreeing oh, yeah. upon the board state is, I, I think, almost needed. I, mm-hmm. I I almost never play games without playing by a 10. Yeah, I think it's necessary for your sanity in a, in a yes. game like this. Yeah, oh, 100%. Mm-hmm. Like, so agreeing upon the board state... Um, a big one is charge rolls. So what we like to do is if if you know, okay, my Howling Banshees are going to be making a charge this turn. They're, ch- they're going to be charging this Marine unit. Before you roll any dice, get your opponent to look at the measurement and be like, hey, is this a 7 or an 8-inch charge? Before you roll any dice. Because once dice have been rolled, if it's a, if you roll a 7 and it's it could be a 7 or an 8, your opponent's going to always lean towards that 8. And you're oh. going to always lean towards the 7. Mm-hmm. So by agreeing upon it before dice are rolled, you kind of both both parties are in the same when you roll actually roll the dice. Yeah, it prevents bias. Yes, exactly. Prevents yeah. prevents bias is a great way to say it. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, even like uh, you were talking about earlier when we were kind of doing a pre discussion, uh, like in your movement phase, if you know that you're gonna charge a unit into an enemy unit, you start before you even move measure your closest model to their closest model and say you're 15 inches away and you move six you know that you have to make a nine inch charge yes so even if you mess up in the movement step and like accidentally place it a little further back or it gets bumped anything like that you know going into the charge phase because you move then you have psychic shooting it's a, it takes a while to get to the charge phase. A lot of stuff can get bumped between now and then. Yes. You know you have to make that 9-inch charge. Yes. And a lot of times, you know, when I'm playing the game, I kind of know this unit's going to be making a charge more than likely. So then I do set up with my opponent in the movement phase, even. Yeah. I, li- I like that a lot. Doing it in the movement phase just clears up any um, feels bad and bias, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that's huge is... Uh, keeping out of your opponent's like shooting threat ranges too like if your opponent you measure their movement and then they're shooting because that's another one um because it's farther range typically than charge distances especially with indirect because they can move in a straight line towards you and not have to worry about going around terrain as much another one uh, we we did in our last game is uh measuring angles like if Mm -hmm. you know we we put dice down and move the models okay if you move here what can you see and i'm going to stay outside of that Mm mm-hmm um, just anything that lets you both agree upon the board state so you don't go ahead and move at thinking one thing but not saying it. Now your mm-hmm. opponent goes ahead and moves, and it's like, well, according to the board state, I can see you. So it's like, well, mm-hmm. you didn't say anything. So Even uh, a big one I like to do is if I'm just towing in range of an objective. Yes. The amount of times your model, like if you bump the table, it just barely falls off. Like if you're using the big like 7-inch uh, mouse pad objectives. Yes. And you're just on the edge with a 25 mil base. Sometimes it can fall off. All the time. Yeah, it, it happens at the most inopportune moments. Yeah, so <laughs> I've just always with those, just, hey, I'm going to be on the objective. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. Now both parties have agreed to it. You're yeah. never going to have an issue. If you have 10 models close to it and you say, okay, five of these are in range, mm-hmm. then you know five of those are in range. Yes. it's It leaves no room for human error. Yep, and, and typically um, this is something you discuss kind of pregame. And along with that uh, is something take backs, mm-hmm. and uh, take backs essentially are just letting, deciding when are we going to allow mistakes that have been made to be erased. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for instance, forgetting an action. If I forget to do R and D as it is now, or originally deploy scramblers, essentially an action that I do in a certain part of the board that gets me points, it's done by a unit that typically isn't. A, is not going to shoot, not going to charge, not going to do anything other than this action. My opponent makes a mistake and, you know, that five-man unit of Dire Avengers that didn't do anything, just sat in the corner. If that thing, if that unit didn't do anything and they forget to do that action, I'll always let them do that action. I'm never going to say no. Oh, every time. Yeah, every time. I mean, the unit didn't do anything. There are very few reasons people don't shoot, don't cast, don't move or advance with a unit, like an infantry unit, and aren't intending to do an action with them. Yes. Especially, I'm 
quite bad at remembering to do R and D or retrieve Nachman data as it is now or rod whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I know I'm gonna forget it. So I'm especially <laughs> <laughs> you're especially like, more willing to. I I will always ask you. Hey, was that unit meant to perform R and D? Yeah. Yeah. Even reminding your opponent. I you know I'll do that yeah. all the time where it's like, did you want to do rod this turn at their another movement? Just so then they don't have the the mess up and becomes yeah. a whole ordeal. It avoids feels bad. So. Yeah, and uh, a thing with takebacks though is it's it's very important when figuring out if you're able to do it or not for yourself or your opponent. Has the board state changed enough to where new information how it may now dictate what you know? Yeah, like it's it's if, a fine line. If someone moves or forgets to move a unit in the shooting or the movement phase and they get to their shooting phase and say the the unit they forgot to move is way on the left side in Dawn of War deployment and a unit way on the right side of the board is shooting at my unit directly in front of them. Yep. And they forgot to move that far left unit in the movement phase. It has nothing to do with the engagement on the other side of the board. Yes. It doesn't affect that. The new information has nothing to do with that other unit. Yep. I'm, I'll definitely let you go back and fix that. Like, yep. the board state for that unit hasn't really changed. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not changing anything else. I'm, right. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Now, when it's something like, hey, I forgot to do this smite, and it's now the charge phase... Ah, you yeah. have a lot of new information about what's been killed in the shooting phase and what the board looks like now. Yeah. And it's it's tough to gauge, all right, should I let this person do this take mm -hmm. back or not? And, you know, a lot of that depends on your opponent, what kind of game you're having with them. Um, sometimes if it's a super contentious game, you might not allow it, you know, because it's that kind of game. But if it's a really chill opponent, again, it just it's such a – there's no, like, fine rule with it. Um, I really personally I really struggle with not letting people take things back I almost always say yes yeah I think it's the Minnesotan in us <laughs> yeah <laughs> now, honestly though I mean I I can't really think of too many times other than games where it's just it's that kind of game everyone both people both people are contentious for whatever reason sometimes you get those you're up against that guy that he's, guy he's yep playing win at all costs yep, and it's just, just not a good time yeah it's like all it right, happens well, we're, we're doing this all right we're going hard um, yeah. but you know, in a game like even, even taking back in deployment, I mean, I had a game against someone where, you know, we're deploying, this guy deploys his, uh, tank, his eye guard, um, Lehman Russ, obviously behind a ruin, obviously meaning to hide. Mm -hmm. But when I went to go deploy, I, there was an, a clear angle in my own deployment zone that I could put my dreadnought down and shoot it first turn if I went first. And I, I did kind of go, I was like, hey, I can shoot this. Do you want to, like, scoot this a little bit so I can't shoot it? Yeah. So I kind of let him, like, take that back just because I personally in that game didn't want to win because he deployed just a smidge off, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Have you had any games recently where you uh, let your opponent take something back or they forgot to do a stratagem that was pivotal in winning and wow. then, like, do, like continuing the game without just losing instantly yeah i i mean so there was a point where i was i was playing a tournament game and uh it was a, a we'd both taken stranglehold and uh the hold the center whatever the direct assault direct is assault. what it was called yeah, yeah. and uh at one point they had forgotten to move a unit, had not done anything. It was a troops unit, OBSEC, had not done anything for the game uh, or for that turn. They had planned to move that unit onto the objective to get Stranglehold and Direct and just forgot to, which would have lost them six points for that turn and made it brought things more into my favor, whether I would have won or lost, mm -hmm. whatever. But uh, would have definitely been a big blow. Big swing. I can't in good conscience, like... I, I, I definitely allowed it, and it, it guaranteed the game in their favor. Yeah. 
and it was hard to accept that loss when I was trying to go for <laughs> yeah. like a four and yeah, you were like, both three and one at that point, right? Yeah, and I wanted to get that four and one, and then try and go from there, see how good I could do. But uh, I I couldn't in good faith do that. I knew yeah. it, it would guarantee me a loss, but the the sportsman in me just couldn't allow it. They they clearly meant to do it. I, I just I couldn't I couldn't let it yeah happen. and it, it's it's such a fine line with all this because mm-hmm. part of me goes with competitive play it's like hey we're here to we're at a tournament you know you got to play your best you can't make um, you got to be mindful with how you move how you deploy mm-hmm. you can't be clumsy with screening out but then the other part of me goes I don't want to win a game because you forgot to move a <laughs> unit that didn't do anything on an objective that you clearly were going to yeah. do so. Uh, such a fine line it's a fine line it's it's hard to find a balance usually and and in that game i will say it was a very friendly game it was it was very much like a there's no no contentiousness in yeah. it at all like it was it was it was a good game i wasn't gonna win in a, a shitty way yeah and it, <laughs> had you been playing someone that a little crappy to play. Yeah, if they were being cutthroat when it yeah. all costs. You might have been like, ah, that sucks. Right? Like, if, if I forgot to deploy my scramblers yeah. or do Knockmond and they didn't let me take it back and then they they forgot to move on that center objective, I'd be a little less likely to grant it to them. But... That, that's happened to me. I, I was playing a game against... I was new ad mech at the time. <laughs> and I had forgotten to... Uh, I think it was Rod at that time. Yep. It was Rod. I forgot to Rod, and it was the start of my psych. Or I cast one thing. I was like, "Oh, I forgot to Rod." And he goes, "Ah, sometimes that just happens." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, it's gonna be this kind of game. Cool." Yeah. And so, um, when he forgot to Rod, you bet your <laughs> ass I didn't let him fucking Rod. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I said the same thing back to him. I was like, ah. As often as that happens, <laughs> it felt so good. I mean, yeah, like I, I give people the benefit of the doubt, and I, yeah. I start every game assuming that it's going to be friendly and sportsmanlike, and I'm going to allow takebacks. Yep. But once someone is, is kind of shitty about it to me, it's like, okay, well, you can't expect me to then give you a bunch of slack. Like, yeah, I'm all for playing a friendly like. A friendly game where we're both kind of helping each other out with that kind of yeah. thing but if you're gonna be win at all costs with me i'm not just gonna keep on helping you out right and you know one thing i find myself doing a lot is let's say i have a character that has a fight last or a relic um and i tell you pregame but <laughs> then you go to charge that character I'll tell you before you even charge. I'll say, hey, do you want to charge him? He's got a fight last. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you before it even happens because a lot of times I do it for my own sake where I'm like, I don't even want to deal with it. I just want to tell you now. Let you decide. And I don't, you know, you don't have to do that for your opponent and your opponent Mm -hmm. doesn't have to do that for you. But it's something you just kind of decide how you want to play. It's, It's a gentleman's game. It is. It's a gentleman's game. It's... There's too many rules, there's too many things going on, too many, like, intricate interactions and synergies and mm-hmm. buffs and debuffs and, right? like, stat lines. Like, you, you kind of have to help each other out. And, yeah. But at a certain time, I also understand the perspective where it's, say, Auspex scan for Space Marines. You know, that's a... every Most people that have been playing know of that stratagem. Mm-hmm. And then you tell your opponent, hey, I can shoot at you if you deep strike within X amount of distance of this unit. Yeah. You tell them pregame, and then your opponent does it. If you tell them in that moment, you'll never get to use aspect scan. So it's <laughs> such a dilemma because mm-hmm. it's like I'll never use aspect scan if I warn my opponent, like more than one time. Yeah. So it's like, do I tell them? Do I not? I always lead on the side just to tell them. Mm-hmm. But I can understand, you know, if you've, especially if you've told them one time before, it's like, well, I've told you, you yeah. know. Even that's that's the kind of thing that happens where you tell them pregame. Yes. And then they go to do it once and you tell them again. And then at that point, if they do it again, it might kind of be on them. I, I it's, it's, it's a fine line. It's and fine I, line. I don't necessarily blame you if, if you've told them three times. And... Yeah. I mean, uh, Space Wolves. I was playing a tournament game against Space Wolves. And Space Wolves had a stratagem where any any unit in their army can heroic uh, heroically intervene. And he told me this, you know, and we were playing and I mistakenly put a unit within three of one of his uh wolf rider boys 
and he rolled with that unit and I went ah oh. but I didn't ask for take back because I was like he told me and he probably gets it all the time where he tells people and they go ah <laughs> oh, can I just scoot outside mm-hmm. you know and it's like you know those kind of things you know even if they don't tell you it's like they'll never get to use it if you just constantly are warning about that heroic intervention yeah so I don't know it's a fine line um and this kind of just goes right into like the open knowledge part of this game uh you had a great uh, analogy to magic with this yeah so so in uh in Magic the Gathering, there's there's like a, a clear set of rules. Uh, all of the rules are on the cards. You you don't know like what's in each other's decks, but oh fuck, I'm having trouble remembering what my analogy was. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's something to do with uh, like, uh, you don't know what your opponent has in their hand. Yeah, like so you, you they but, have but hidden you, information. They have hidden. They have some like their plan is hidden to you, but you know all of the rules of the game and yes. like the mechanics that are available to the game. Um, but magic, like you don't know what's in their deck. Uh, that's that's part of the game is is like not knowing specifically what their build is. But in Warhammer Forty Thousand, there's so many rules. Uh, all of the codices are, are kind of open knowledge. They're, yes. The way you unlock these rules is by buying GW's book, essentially. Yep. Where you you should be playing assuming that everyone has has knowledge to every rule in the game. It's, it's one of those things where, like, in Magic, like you said, you don't know the build of the deck. You mm-hmm. don't know what cards they have. You don't know, like... You know, with a blue deck, you don't know how many uh, counters they have. Yeah. Whereas, like, let's say I'm playing against anybody. I could have a cart with me at a tournament that mm-hmm. has all the codices with it, all the rules. And yep. if I'm playing that person, I could pull up that rule and know all of the rules. Yeah. And so we kind of, like, to, uh, with the open knowledge game, there's so many rules. Try to, like, tell your opponent, you know, give them a heads up with certain things, you know? Like, don't hide things from people. Yeah. As far as... Uh, it might not be illegal, but let's say you ask somebody, hey, can this unit advance and charge? And you go, no, it's not on the data sheet. Knowing full and well you have a stratagem that lets you advance and charge. Now, there's people like this. It's dirty. <laughs> it's dirty. It's scummy. No one endorses this kind of uh, playing. Like Except for those guys. Those guys. There's those guys that do. But... For the most part, you know, if you ask somebody or if someone asks you, can this unit do X, you tell them any way that they could do this. Even yeah. a lot of times people say, can you do advance and charge with this unit? And I say, not with this build, but I could just to let mm-hmm. them know, like, just because I can't doesn't mean if you play somebody else the next round that they can't, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I do that kind of stuff too. Yeah, and that goes along with, like, combos. Like, anytime... Like, for me, when someone asks you, can this unit heroically intervene, you tell them any way they could possibly do that, or do anything Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you don't say, well, no, they're not characters, they can't heroically intervene, but then you have a 1 CP strat that lets you pick a non-character infantry unit that can heroic 6. Yeah, like... You, You don't just say, well, no, this unit can't, but... Yeah, and there are people like that, and we've, yeah. you know, even in our Minnesota meta, we've heard of people that <laughs> that are like this. You know, we won't name names, but we've heard of, you know, people that have placed well that are kind of scummy like this. Yeah, well, I, I I would like to interrupt briefly and say we are copywriting Minnesota meta. Uh, yes, Minnesota meta is copyrighted. Um, if you try, you will be contacted with a cease and assist. So GW style. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah um yeah i don't know i i just for me mm-hmm. and like we've s- said this whole game try to just be an open book yeah it's it's this is just too much to keep track yeah. of and and when you look at the top players too like the art of war guys um i don't know any other top players but <laughs> people in our meta like the glass top, hammer gaming yeah glass hammer Pretty gaming goon hammer the <laughs> they're, they're doing top I mean, level. W- look at minnesota we got like the ben sherwins charlie andres yeah. james kellings tyler raise i can't say his last name i'm sorry yeah but uh, <laughs> people like that i mean they all play the game the same kind of way where it's it's gentleman like yeah and i know like the the closer to the top tables you get 
the more forthcoming and gentlemanly and like sportsman like yeah. the uh, the players are. And that's great because I think that just continues to develop more people that will play, play play like this. Mm-hmm. And I know personally, I don't have fun playing contentious games. No, nobody does. No, I don't want to. I don't want to play anal rules where I'm hovering over you. I want to just play relaxed. You tell me mm-hmm. what. You tell me. You you know you tell me what how yeah. far this is. You know kind of thing. Absolutely. Uh, I have way more fun playing those kind of games than when I'm playing. Mm, that looks like 6.2 inches. Mm, you, you know what I mean? Like, right. No yeah. one likes playing those kind of games. Kind of like, uh, oh, the uh, the debacle of 8-inch charges from Deep Strike with uh, Raiders. Ah. Because they're an inch off the ground. Yes. So technically, using the uh, Pythagorean theorem. Yes. You only needed to roll an 8 on the dice to successfully charge from Deep Strike? Yeah, it's like... God damn this game. Like, I don't know very many people that would do that, but there no. certainly were. I've not I never met anyone that did that, but there's enough horror stories of people doing it. Yeah, that GW <laughs> just went for it. Damn it, nine inches only from Deep Strike. <laughs> That's it. That's all you fuckers get. Sweeping declaration. Yeah, they just Thank went, you. Thank you. Thank you, GW. <laughs> Praise be. You know, they they get a lot of shit from a lot of people, us included. Yes. At times. I will but roast GW. For all their faults, they're actually trying to keep things updated and actually, like, even though some of them are light or heavy handed, releasing updates in a more timely fashion. They're doing fantastic. I mean, yeah. uh, since that first bat- uh, data slate update that they did in, like, October, November ish. Mm-hmm. They've been doing a great job, in my opinion. I mean, they've done another one. They're doing chapter approves. I mean, although they're forty dollars, I mean, they're still updating the game constantly, yeah. which is way more than we had when we first started playing the game. Oh yeah. And it, 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 you know, as much as we're like, come on, GW, this is an easy fix. It's a large game. Yeah. There's a lot of rules in this game. So many like little little bits to that interact with each other. Like, yeah. It's it's such a huge scale to balance things on yeah i mean it's like another thing i mean i always i've been i've been clamoring for universal special rules bring them back please gw because a lot of i mean i can't tell you how many rules interactions are problems because of the way this wording is different from this wording i mean Mm -hmm. take tau bodyguard ruling is different than the marine bodyguard ruling Mm mm-hmm but it's supposed to do the same thing because they have different writers and they word things slightly differently. Mm-hmm. And it does affect the way it, it plays, rules as written. Absolutely. And so I just, ah, please, Universal Special Rules, please, GW. <laughs> That's my one wish for 10th edition. Yeah, we've had it before. Bring it back. Bring it back. But yeah, like at least the days of not getting a codex for like three or four editions are gone. <laughs> yeah. Seemingly are Seem- gone. Yeah. Um, I mean, shoot, when we were playing uh, Drukari, it was like 10 years old when we first started playing. <laughs> yeah, when I first started the, the playing the Codex. Game, yeah. I mean, army, if, armies just didn't get updated for mm-hmm. decades. If there was a, a broken problem, like, deal with it till the next book. Yeah, pretty much. And it's like, well, hopefully no one's that guy. And it's, well, there were that guy. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, GW, we're moving in a better direction. Um, yeah. One thing, you know... With the with the constant updates, I feel, in my opinion, with competitive, it's kind of leaning towards it's going to be rewarding people that stick with like one faction, maybe two, but really one. Like if you sit down and you master your one faction, you're going to be able to handle the updates a lot better than a little meta hopper like ya boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I agree, and I do like it. Like I. It's going to make it a lot harder to adjust to new rules for an army and new rules for the missions. It's going to reward, like, knowing your army inside and out and knowing how to adapt your army to the missions. Yeah. Um, and the the quarterly balance updates will hopefully keep things from being broken. So yes. if we keep everything kind of where they should be, it'll reward... Uh, learning your your list inside and out and yes. rewarding player skill over just bringing the most broken metal list yes um i mean because you know people are complaining about custodius right now about being super op thick city which they're strong do not get it twisted they're s <laughs> tier they're the most powerful but we've seen way worse in this game so i really like the constant battle 
uh, slate updates because it's just like you said it's it's gonna really reward for like faction mastery yeah in my opinion so mm-hmm. like for me in this uh 2022 <laughs> yep. that's ah, here okay okay uh, still early still, <laughs> still, early, still early. early uh 2022 we were uh, right in 2021 for a whole year yeah so. <laughs> well i keep for, i'm thinking it's 2023 that's where i'm at i don't know what's going on in my brain like i'm not forget 2021 i'm thinking it's 2023 i don't know why um no idea but i'm an announcer right now gonna be playing eldar that is going to be my faction for this year i'm going to be playing it you know i might dip my toes with my sisters because i enjoy them a lot but the eldar what i'm going to bring to um two competitive tournaments yeah it's it was your first faction i love it it's it's like homecoming yep it's homecoming i'm excited for the release but um i'm i'm excited because last year um outside of like a couple rtts i didn't play this the same faction twice like at turn at GT level at the GT level, I didn't play the same faction more than once. I just kept army hopping. I was kind of able to because the missions were the same. Mm-hmm. Generally, like you know, points were kind of what they were, but builds didn't change crazy. So I kind of under you know once you once missions have been out for nine months, you understand kind of how the game is play, being played. You know. Oh yeah. Like you can really figure out missions, so to speak, and apply that to different armies relatively quickly. Um, with the new updates, with the new missions, and with them supposedly changing twice a year, yeah, I don't think it's going to really reward people that are meta hopping, in my opinion. Right, especially like even to add on to that, the the added complexity of a, a tertiary or added primary yes. mission. Yes, like, I heard people. Some people are speculating it's not really going to change things too much. I disagree. I disagree. I I think it's big. You know, we haven't played enough to give a comprehensive review, but the couple games i've played the tertiary is big it adds a mm-hmm. different dimension with the actions that you need to do at least we've i've only played the actual action ones so far mm-hmm. but yeah i was playing a uh, a list that did not have much obsec and uh it has not really been updated to the new rule set uh and we we're playing the tear down their icons and uh, my opponent had dropped down like three bombs, and I just didn't have the units to get up into the midboard to because uh, he did it right over my territory. Yeah, I just didn't have the units to get up in the midboard midboard uh, to disarm them in time. By the time I could, you can only do one a turn. It was already too late, so he uh, he got an extra eight points on primary just from the like tertiary mission. And now with primary being lower. Um, eight points is a turn of hold one, hold two. Yeah, that's, like, that's a whole huge. Hold that's a whole primary turn mm-hmm. with the tertiary. It's big. It's huge. So, I mean, you're probably looking at that and you're like, "Wow, I cannot afford to do action the tertiary actions right now." I this my list needs to change. Correct. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, so I'm I'm excited where it's going. Um, mm-hmm. Have you decided yet what you're gonna kind of go for? Are you gonna meta hop a little bit, play different armies <sighs> in the competitive scene? You gonna see, take a drink here to decide? Let me let me just take a little sip of my old fashioned. A little old fashioned. Mm. Ah. Right. Or my blue moon, or my monster, or my water. I got variety out the ass tonight. Yeah, uh, and we are sponsored by all. <laughs> if only <laughs> that were the case. Yeah. Um, no, I. Uh, I would like to play Eldar, but I am hardcore Quins, and my Eldar army would be mostly Quins, and it sounds like. From the leaks, like, Quins are going to be good. I, I think until we get the whole picture, I'm not going to make any snap judgments. Yes. But I don't think Quins are going to be the, like, meta option for tournaments. Uh, Quins are going to be my hobby, hobby army. I want that new Avatar of Kane and the new Ranger Ooh. units so bad. Yes. But I'm thinking Tyranids. If Tyranids get their codex around end of March, which it's looking like, if GW stays on time, yep. it would be end of March-ish, might have it in time for the Spring Up Renegade. Let's go. I hope I Let's hope it's go. in time for the Spring Up. Yep. But uh, I am painting Tyranids uh, for this season. I have a decent chunk of Tyranids already painted, so it's less painting for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think they have access to cheap infantry units that fly, that are on the ground. They have psychic offense and defense. They're good at shooting. They're good at uh, melee. With the new like uh, Tyranid stat lines that were leaked, they look like they're going to be melee blenders. They look yes. like uh, their shooting's going to be decent. They're going to two-up saves on a lot of their monsters. 
uh, T8 and getting more wounds. Their big bugs are looking scary. Their big bugs are looking scary and supported by infantry. Because I'm assuming with the new codex, we'll have good enough options. I won't be forced to take Crusher Stampede or Leviathan. Like, Or you might want to. Who you knows? might want to. Who, Who knows? knows? Yeah. But uh, if I can mix some cheap infantry in there for objectives, like I love gargoyles with the new missions. Oh, I love gargoyles. Ten-man flying infantry with a 12-inch move. Uh, with deep strike baked in if yep. they want it i love it i love it um to add on to that i i agree that uh even if quins are kind of good they have such a limited model range like yeah you yeah. can soup and craft rules but your heart lies with the clowns does it yep. not so i i am a loyal follower of the laughing god yeah and uh and that being the case, I mean, regardless of if it's good right away or not, it's hard to adapt to metas as they change with the Harlequins. And you yeah. saw this even when they were S tier. Mm-hmm. You saw them just slowly. I mean, they weren't. They never got like horrible, mm-hmm. unplayable. But you saw them go from S tier to, to never being able to adapt again. Yeah. Whereas like Drakari have been S tier for so long, but they've been able to adapt with their their mm-hmm. ver- uh, vast model. Um, range. Yeah, they they could do their raider spam, and when that wasn't good, shift to thick city, yep. uh, Talawai and uh, Rax. Yeah. Um, the the Tyranids are able to like shift to adapt to nerfs and buffs, whereas the Quins, like if one unit gets a nerf or a buff, it changes the entire that list. That could be it. It could be. A, it, it, it could be done. Yeah. If they get a, a slight buff on a key unit, it could make the army S tier. If they get a slight nerf on a key unit, it could drop the whole army down a tier or two. To unplayable, even. To unplayable, yeah. Like, if players are what hold the army up and they get a nerf, it's it's the whole army that's it's wraps. Like, yeah. I mean, it's it, even if the army doesn't change, but the meta mm-hmm. around you changes. Oh, absolutely. Because it's like, if you're not efficient at killing, you know, I'm just throwing something out there, like mm-hmm. Crusher Stampede. Yeah. Whether you are right now or not, but let's say you're not. You could just be toast if the if the if the meta changes to like durable things and you can't kill that mm-hmm. you're done. Especially with uh, most of my damage dealing relies on haywire in my eighth ed book. Yeah. If when crusher stampede got big, if I don't have enough fusion pistols, the haywire doesn't do anything versus yeah. crusher. And uh, I mean or, maybe griblies, but the, uh, it's like eh. there's no griblies in crusher. What yeah. am I even saying? Yeah, no. <laughs> but like uh, yeah, Tyrannids, like you said, I mean they they have. One of the most um, vast model ranges for as far as builds you could do, whether mm-hmm. it's good or not, you could do big bugs, you could do small bugs, fly bugs, like you said. You play every phase of the game, like you said. I mean, they they quite literally do it all. Yeah. Like the fluff. They're very adaptable. Yeah, they exactly. <laughs> and it's kind of like the Eldar for me. I mean, yeah. they were my first army, but... I just got lucky because I like how they play, you know? <laughs> right. Like, a lot of times people's first armies are like, eh, it'll always be my first love, but eh, mm-hmm. it's not for me f- forever. But like Eldar, they play every phase of the game. Yeah. And uh, I love things that move quickly. Oh, do I love a good movement. Yeah, movement phase is like my favorite phase. Yeah, I mean, that's my biggest gripe with the sisters is I'm like, ah, I'm so slow, six inch movement, what is this? I play like Battlesuit, Tau, Tyranids and Eldar. Yep. If it doesn't move fast, I don't want to play it. Yeah, you throw it away. Mm-hmm. You played one game of Thousand Suns, and you're like, "What is this?" I so am I a hipster for it? I don't know, but I I have never owned a power armor army. They're just too slow for me. Uh, I just can't do it. I tried playing Thousand Suns. You can teleport and stuff, but like everything's moving like five or six inches. I just I gotta go fast. Yeah, they go burr. Like, if I don't have a bunch of units that are moving, like, 10, 14 inches, like... With fly? <laughs> yeah, like, I like fly, yeah. I like moving 16 plus 6. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's to the point where, I mean, 10-inch move feels slow. When you're playing Eldar, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, this only moves 10? It's kind of slow. It's not fast. I yeah. wouldn't say it's fast. My Tyranids can double move with two units a turn. Oh, crazy speed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I uh, So, I mean, I'm, I'm excited because you played a decent if not all all your gts you played the uh tyranids last year yeah so i'm kind of thinking Build doubling down it. yeah building on it just trying to use them as my tournament army yeah and i like that because i mean where we've started last year to where we are now i mean mm-hmm. i think i would shrek my old self from a year ago oh yeah i don't know if you feel the same oh yeah like the the amount of progress you make in a year is big yeah so i mean i'm i'm excited to just master an army for me that's big because i 
have just hobby ADHD. <laughs> I, the new thing comes out and I go, ooh, that looks enticing. I'm sure when Tyranids come out after Eldar, I'll be being. I've always been an Eldar. I've always been a Tyranid fan. Oh yeah, but no. I, I I bought some of your Tyranids from a while back. Like, <laughs> I mean, I did shoot. You got I, a couple Tyranids still at my I, place. I, I do. Are still yours. <laughs> <laughs> are they calling you? Are they calling you? Another thing, you know, we kind of talked about this. I didn't bring this up in the pre-discussion, but uh, as far as trying to win, you know, we. Right now, I'd consider us. I don't know if you think this is fair or not, but like mid mid table players with mm-hmm. aspirations to be just slightly above mid table. Yeah, I feel like if we had more time to commit to it. But yeah. As it stands, we're we're we we can we can do quite well at the mid tables. <laughs> yeah, we're we're mid tier mid table heroes. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. Mid table heroes. Um, and it's but I mean when you when you look at the top players, they're playing multiple games a week, every mm-hmm. week, if not like. A game a day at least yeah and we just i might have time for two games a week maybe you know Mm -hmm. and so to me the top players typically meta hop right so they switch to whatever is good which you know they should if they're playing that many games why not Mm -hmm. but uh because we can't i think it's in your best interest if you can't play that many games to master one faction yeah absolutely so then like your reps aren't wasted quote unquote mm-hmm. i mean you never waste reps but if you're only ever playing tyranids and you just keep playing them you've played them into demons you've played them into gsc well now you still have those banked <laughs> reps into that army and you kind of you kind of know how they play yeah even if I it agree. was from like months ago so i think if you want to compete with the like more top level players i think you really need to just master one faction and just keep sticking with it yeah I think you have a better shot if you do that and uh, then trying to hop to whatever the flavor of the month is and learning a list you don't know. Yeah, because, I mean, one thing I've said, too, is, like, for me, bringing a metal list to a tournament, I kind of, the last one I went to, I'm, like, bringing Grey Knights, and I'm, like, I'm not going to be the best Grey Knight player here. Hmm. So, I'm not, A, that. I'm not going to be the best Grey Knight player here, and B, the top players are going to have games 100% into Grey Knights, and I'm not going to have games into whatever they're playing. Mm-hmm. so they're just gonna know how to beat me and i'm gonna have no idea i basically i have to just hope my game plan works whereas they know their game plan works mm-hmm. pretty much you know what i mean oh yeah and that's it's kind of like what uh you were talking about uh, a little while back where uh, like we're almost better off taking off meta shit yes because if we take like more of the commonly meta lists the people that are at the top tables have reps into our list yes. and know what our game plan is. Mm-hmm. So our, our odds are far better taking something off meta and going for like something they're not expecting. Yes, because then if we don't, then it's like we both don't know how to play each other. Let's go. <laughs> right? Like, levels the playing field a bit. Levels it a little bit. Like even if it's a little worse, I think it's better to play something that's a little, that's like worse, but they don't know how to play into it. Yeah. versus something that's better but they know exactly what to do because mm-hmm. i find most of the time you lose games because you didn't know what the other army did yeah you didn't know how to play it in the macro strategy like whether to be aggro uh aggressive or defensive mm-hmm. whether to uh play for late game or early game i mean if you're thinking back to your gts so we played at the spring up last year um i played at a summer gt renegade and then we both played at iowa and then <laughs> iowa iowa and then uh the uh the renegade major mm-hmm. so those tournaments if i'm going through and i'm combing all of my losses almost every one of them was the first time i've ever played that army yeah my losses so like to me that just kind of shows like an experience in an army if you guess your game plan wrong you're just gonna lose yeah a lot of times if this if the skill levels is relatively equal you're gonna lose unfortunately oh yeah like even in the the renegade gt i had that game versus death guard yeah. and uh i had just gotten a bunch of reps into death guard in practice uh and he wasn't aware what the the new tyranid leviathan rules were and uh <sighs> He, he played his army extremely well. He had a lot of answers to what my army brought with it. And uh, what it came down to was I just knew what his list did more so than he knew what my list did. Yeah. I mean, think back to uh, the first Iowa. 
Mm-hmm. You played into a sisters player round one. No idea what sisters did. Never played against yeah. them this edition. No Crushed. idea. <laughs> yeah, you, you lost because you're like, I don't know what the heck is going on. Mm-hmm. But then the next time in that same tournament you played Sisters, what happened? I I knew what their units did. I knew how to how to kind of counter it, and I I absolutely won that game handily. Yeah, it, it feels good when that happens. That yeah. happened to me the first two times I played against uh, new released Admech. Got my booty handed to me. <laughs> got destroyed because I just you know you don't mm-hmm. know what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. And then the Iowa when I played an ad into Admech, mm-hmm. I I was able to pull the game out because I understood what they kind of did and what to do against that army. Absolutely. So yeah, I I'm hoping with the Eldar I'll be able to bring off. That's my goal is to bring off meta stuff, Zach. I like it. I like that a lot. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean. It's kind of loosey goosey podcast, just kind of going all over. Yeah, this was a, a little bit uh, stream of consciousness. Yep, we had just a general kinda... goal that I think we covered fairly well. Yeah, I think we did pretty good. <laughs> uh, you got to see the uh, insanities of our minds. Yeah, it's uh, it's not exactly a straight line. Sometimes it kind of loops around, but yep. <laughs> I feel like we always get there in the end. <laughs> we always get there in the end. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. And on that note, I think we're going to wrap this up unless you got something else. A little closing thoughts. No, I, I I like it. Uh, just, you know what? Go out there. If you're going to tournaments or a pickup game at your local, friendly local hobby store, um, be forthcoming. Go in there trying to play a fun game with your opponent. You're you're playing a game with your opponent, not against your opponent. I've always liked, I kind of like to call it a dialogue. Have yeah. a dialogue with your yep. opponent. Like, make the game a conversation. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, make it like, like you said, we're playing with your opponent. Mm-hmm. so you're making a conversation you know i don't know yeah like, i've heard people describe it it's it's not so much your opponent as your co-player <laughs> yes your co-player like mm-hmm. when you're doing things like you're not attacking your, you that unit you're giving your opponent a question and see if they mm-hmm. can answer that question yeah absolutely so yeah with that uh make sure you guys have uh great pre-games oh yeah great pre-game discussions ask lots of questions lots of questions give lots of answers People aren't always withholding things. Sometimes you just forget to uh, tell them your weird niche stratagem yeah, that will come into play Yeah, it's not always later. malicious. No. And, uh, yeah, so on that note, we will catch you guys next week. Yeah. Take care.